Okay, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's very exciting. Um, I was told that the audience is very uh, broad. Uh, how many of you are physicists? Okay. Um, the generation is also very mixed too. It's, it's going to be interesting. So um, I want to start by talking about, um, so my title of my talk is Learning Quantum Emergence with Artificial Intelligence. I want to start uh, by talking about what I mean by emergence. Um, emergence is, uh, means when a new state arises um, as a result of many individual constituents coming together, a state that cannot be broken down to the properties of individuals. I want to start by um, something that we are more familiar with, that's individual human. Now, when we might understand quite a bit about individuals, but that does not necessarily tell us uh, what to expect of all different possibilities that can emerge. So, so here is an example that you're probably... Uh, so this is a wave in a stadium during London Olympics. You probably have seen this or participated in it. What's, um, what, what you've seen, this uh, propagation of pulse, is a result of many individuals interacting with each other following certain rule. And um, if you've been to a stadium or a theater, there are always people whose legs sticking out uh, presenting a, a tripping hazard, but the wave will propagate without um, caring about such defects and uh, scatterers because the property of this wave is very different from property of individuals. Now that was a, that involved about 100,000 individuals. There is a very, and that was a very coherent state. Now here is an example of, uh, uh, it's not working, not advancing. So this is a very different state, um, a stampede happening, and it's a very incoherent state. Now, um, going down in scale from the uh, example of human and the social phenomena, um, where my interest lies is go all the way down to the regime of the smallest scale, going from the smallest scale to the just the scale up, that is the uh, the emergent phenomena involving electrons. It's not advancing. When I first started um, thinking about what I want to study as a physicist, I, I realized that you know studying something that is manageable in size, and that something that I understand the properties of the individuals. Electrons are fundamental particles after all. Um, would be something that is satisfying. And um, the different states of quantum emergence that we now can under we now understand includes um, this kind of system exhibiting topological phase and this kind of system exhibiting high temperature superconductor. So um, why learn quantum emergence? Well, on one hand, the fact that uh, we are dealing with fundamental particles about which we know everything gives us the hope that we might be able to tell when we are right and when we are wrong. And that's all intellectually um, satisfying. But there is a greater reason. If we can uh, discover and or uh, design new materials with desirable properties, that can revolutionize a civilization. Now, if you don't know where this is from, this is Black Panther movie. It's a great movie for many reasons. I highly recommend it. My son introduced me to the movie. But um, there are challenges. The challenges are that, first of all, trying to understand emergent phenomena of electrons typically in our material systems, means having to understand trillion, trillion individual electrons. Not 100,000, not even trillion, but trillion, trillion. 
That's really many, big number. But moreover, we are dealing with quantum mechanical degrees of freedom that uh, there is a partial differential equation, much simpler looking, but uh, um, that's uh, just in the symbols. There is this wave function that's describing the uh, physics of the individual degrees of freedom. And even the simplest setting, electron in a hydrogen atom can be, in a, uh, can be exhibiting probability distribution of many, many of these types. And the fact that we cannot just see them and catch them and move them uh, present challenges in understanding as well as in um, exper uh, doing experiments with them. So for me, learning quantum emergence means being able to go from complex reality of data, such as phase diagrams and many-body wave functions, to some simple principles. Some simple principles that I can carry on and, and discuss, uh, have conversations about, such as entropy, phonons, um, topological invariant, Fermi statistics, entropy, the principle of entropy and temperature tells us that when you try to lower the temperature, you're going to be driven by energy. The phonons, uh, understanding of electron phonon interaction was critical for our understanding of conventional superconductors. Topological invariants are a great way of simply representing the material system that exhibits topologically non-trivial uh, phenomena, Fermi statistics is the, the uh, foundation or guiding principle for thinking about many, body, uh, many electron wave functions. So when we, when we say we've learned something about quantum emergence, we want to be able to go boil down some complex reality to some simple principles, and we want to be able to, if we have understood it in a right way, we want to be able to model uh, the reality. But all this whole process is challenging because the equation governing the system is A, uh, very hard to solve with so many degrees of freedom, but B, even if we can solve it, connecting it to the experiment is often very non-trivial. So now what are the uh, data-driven challenges? I said in a sample of you know, typical size, there will be a uh, trillion, trillion number of electrons. I cannot draw them all. So here is a, a depiction of what a wave function looks like when you have 49 electrons. First of all, with just 49 electrons, um, the wave function, many body wave function, is a function in trillion, 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 trillion dimensional space. I was giving this talk to an audience who I wasn't sure whether 10 to the 20 something would mean uh, how big it is, and worked hard to translate it down to trillions. Maybe it wasn't necessary for this audience. Now, what is this picture of? This is a picture of uh, what's called nodal surface. Take 49 electrons, fix the position of one, and, uh, uh, fix the position of, I'm sorry, 48. And now, so the green dots are the fixed positions of 48 electrons. And I'm moving one remaining electron around. This is a way of making a cut through the, uh, this high dimensional space. And the color shows when the sign of the wave function changes. So when my one electron in the presence of these 48 electrons moves from here to there, the wave function has to change sign, and again and again. This complexity of nodal structure is uh, an exemplification of a way of depicting how complex this many body wave functions that I want to deal with uh, are. Maybe you're not a theorist, maybe you're not, a, a simulate, you're not somebody who simulates, but an experimentalist. Now, uh, Michael talked about X-ray. X-ray was uh, invented 100 years ago, and when it was first invented, the detectors were films. Now, um, the detector technology have um, evolved greatly, as this chart shows. And nowadays, we have uh, very sophisticated detectors that generate um, terabytes of data. Both the uh, technology for the detectors, as well as the, uh, the ways that the instrumentation for doing the experiments have evolved a great deal over the span of last 100 years or so. But um, the way we are analyzing this data has not really um, evolved as much. Um, and in fact, large part of the analysis of data sets like this 
um, relies on this so-called forward modeling, where um, you try to imagine what a data given a system will look like and try to compare with the experiment because of the phase problem. Now, this is a, a, a three-dimensional data set uh, from Cornell High Energy Synchrotron Source called CHESS. And um, this is hard to visualize. Uh, so if you take a cut, again, this is a 2D cut. And now, um, these different, different groupings of the data are uh, results of uh, months and months of working hard at analyzing this data. So what, what are they showing? These are different types of um, uh, signal that is these different labels are saying the signal came from different source. Some of the signal came from glue, some came from sample holder, obviously you don't care about them. Some came from window, some came from the lattice motion phonon, and some has to do with electrons. Now let's say if I care about electrons, I would like to just be able to focus on what has to do with electrons, but uh, the data volume is big. And a uh, typical mode of analysis is to take data during a beam time for a uh, course about, uh, over a span of a week, and then spend the next six months to a year uh, making, studying various guest cuts. That's in reciprocal space. Now this is a very famous uh, data set um, from this kind of setup, measuring a macroscope in a macroscopic tunnel junction, measuring tunnel density of states. We understand every aspect of this data. We know why there is a suppression, that's the gap. We know why there's a peak, that's a coherence peak. But not only these very sharp and salient features, we also understand what's this little bump here and what's that little bump there. Being able to explain all these features of this data gave us confidence that we know what's going on uh, modeling the system through BCS uh, theory. Now fast forward to 2000s. Now instead of studying a macroscopic tunnel junction, where uh, many of my colleagues, uh, including Hoffman Group here at, at Harvard, study this kind of setting where you the, the tunnel barrier is being replaced by a vacuum, and now you're uh, measuring this uh, tunneling conductance as a function of position. Many different experimental probes that are used for condensed matter systems, hard condensed matter systems have now moved on to this kind of scanning mode. And the idea was that if we have more information about uh, the material systems that are uh, presenting mystery to us, if we only had more data, we'll be able to just solve them all. That was the, that was the vision. So now we have a lot of data, but uh, now what we are realizing is that we don't, have the, um, we don't have the framework to analyze the data. Now, in a setting like this, you get a data set like this, and you can already see that the previous mode of analysis is not going to work. So um, the fact that, um, that we are dealing with quantum mechanical degrees of freedom about which you, we can only know so much of. They are always fundamentally mysterious uh, because of the uncertainty principle, and we can never observe the wave function. We are only observing the amplitude. So there is that fundamental restriction, and there is the, uh, that presents uh, challenges in calculation as well as in uh, interpreting data. Now, um, what I was um, introduced to two years ago was, the, was this eye-opening discovery that I'm not the only person, or well, rather my colleagues and my community is not the only uh, people who care about understanding complexity of data. Um, but actually, there are many different communities that care about dealing with complex data and want to be able to understand simple principles called regression and classification, want to be able to go from simple principles to the modeling that's called generated modeling. And you want to be able to do the hypothesis test. So um, when I was first uh, introduced to this notion, it presented this hope that perhaps embracing some of these tools that are developed by uh, many people um, can actually help us make progress. So, um, and then we started to, my group and others, about two years ago, uh, 
uh, this activity in trying to use machine learning for quantum condensed matter physics have really been uh, accelerating. And there are a lot of uh, papers out there now. Um, if we are to embrace this idea that maybe we should try to use this uh, artificial neural network's ability to model functions like Michael uh, presented, we should know how it makes decisions and how we can train. When I was first entering this uh, field, um, personally, I found I had this experience of very unexpected work-life balance at play. I'm a, I'm a mother, and um, I, when I'm not doing physics, I think a lot about um, giving feedback to my children and trying to train them, help them make the right decision independently one day. So um, I am guessing that this might be already familiar to some of you, but um, in case it isn't, let me try to present my view of how neural network makes decisions. So this kid dropped food and has to make a decision about what, to go, what, what he or she is going to do about it. And the decision is determined by weights and biases. First of all, the kid will take inputs through the sensory um, part how, how long it has been, is mom watching, I'm the bad cop in the family, how sweet is it, how green is it. I'm labeling each of these inputs as a vector because they are treated as an input vector. Now there will be the output, the decision the child makes, whether to pick it up, the food, and eat it or let it be. And this Decision making is essentially a function that takes this input vector, maps out to this um, output space. Now, um, different parts of the brain, and this is my limited knowledge of brain, um, I know enough, uh, I, I, I know with confidence that different parts of the brain apparently have different opinions at different times. For instance, we have lower part of the brain that we share with reptiles, and uh, we also have part of the brain that only mammals have, and apparently they have different functions. I'm not a neuroscientist, and, and I cannot claim any more knowledge, but it sounds reasonable. Um, now, in our neural network, different neurons will take these inputs with different weight. The weight will depend on the input as well as which neuron is taking the, weight, uh, the input and will come with different biases. So, um, and then this um, nonlinear processing, some neurons would fire, uh, each neuron would fire or not fire depending on this whole argument that is a matrix times the input vector plus the bias vector. And that will be all collected into an output. So this is the whole um, functional expression. Now, uh, my children, the way they came to me well, I mean, born out of me, let's say, um, were making decisions that were not desirable. And my son at age of eight is still every now and then making these decisions that are not conforming to uh, my ideas. But um, I try to train them. And um, unfortunately, I cannot just go in and fix what's in their brain. So all I can do is to give feedbacks. And that's how we train neural networks as well. So uh, we give training examples. Uh, that are labeled, so this set of the training set is supposed to uh, lead to one desired output and this set for another desired output. And then we, we at the end of uh, training, once the uh, neural network makes its own decision at, at that given instance, we compare the output with the desired output and try to minimize this cost function. And one of the reasons why we are seeing a lot of progress in machine learning is that uh, there, there have been a lot of developments in stochastic gradient descent algorithms that allows us to do this um, training effectively. So, um, okay, well that's all good. What can we, in, in studying quantum condensed matter physics, quantum emergence, what can we do with artificial neural networks? First of all, um, Michael already introduced the idea that neural networks represent 
functions or approximate functions. And there have been efforts to use a neural network to represent many-body wave functions in a compact way. And here is, uh, is the network that's um, in use called re um, Restricted Boltzmann Machine. This uh, network pro has parameters, uh, these network parameters. Those are a way of parameterizing this wave function. And the cost function for this case, a natural cost function, is the energy. If you have a Hamiltonian in mind, and this becomes a new mode of do doing variational um, calculations. I mentioned that um, quantum mechanics intrinsically limits the uh, degree to which we can have information about the system. Now, um, in, the, in the age of uh, racing for quantum information, people have these uh, quantum systems that they want to know what state it is in, but we can only observe the amplitude. And then there is a big problem of being able to go from the amplitude to reconstruct the actual state, all the phases. And that's called quantum state tomography. And in this paper, a um, uh, group from uh, uh, Waterloo have shown that uh, they can use uh, uh, RBM, restricted Boltzmann machine, to have a very uh, satisfactory quantum state tomography. The uh, artificial neural networks have been also used to classify simulated data, um, sort of in the mode similar to what Michael was talking about towards the end of his talk. Uh, now trying to uh, classify data set uh, from simulation to obtain the phase diagram. The insight here is that we might, when we simulate, we try to calculate very carefully, say, order parameters or other quantities. At the end of the day, what we're after is kind of multiple choice question when we are trying to do the coloring of the phase diagram. So that's kind of a general overview of what's been happening in my community over the course of the last two years or so. Now let me talk about what's been happening in my group. So until we started working on this, um, most of the uh, examples of application had been limited to kind of benchmarking. Uh, let's say toy models, Ising model kind of um, toy models. And it's important because we're trying to use new tool. It's, it's important to make sure that we know what we're doing. But um, obviously the question is, can we move beyond the systems that we already know the answers to? And can we really justify using machine learning by dealing with uh, situations where other traditional means do not exist? And what we've been focusing on is in, in uh, synthetic data or simulated data, discerning topological phases or out of equilibrium phases, where what we now call traditional mode of regression, that is the order parameter, is not available. And we've been also working on um, seeking theoretical insight from experimental data. Uh, I'm going to talk about talk a little bit about STM data analysis that is uh, in preprint at the moment, but uh, we are also uh, having a lot of fun working on X-ray data analysis as well as scanning, uh, tunneling, uh, transmission electron microscopy. And uh, what's, been, uh, what's been our strategy is to really seek new insight through synergy. And this is um, strategic in um, two ways. First of all, um, I'm not a computer scientist by training, so I'm not going to beat uh, professionals in coming up with new algorithms, but I know my problems very well. Like Michael said, it's important that somebody jumps up and down and say, this is a problem. That is important. That's one, one part of the st strategy. The second part of the strategy is that I like my job very much and I don't want to be replaced, so I'm going to stay very important and relevant in what we do. And early on, we realized that um, in coming up with the strategies for feature selection for our um, quantum data, theoretical insight might be very important. So now here is cat, but there's also a dog. And now I'm going to ask you to be very involved and take a vote. How, who thinks number one is cat? Come on. Okay, who thinks number two is cat? One is a cat and the other is a dog. <laughs> Some of you got it wrong, but don't worry. It's, nothing's wrong with your vision or brain. 
It's just, you know, I was being mean. Um, why was I being mean? I was not showing you the features that allow you to recognize um, cat and dog. And to my mind, uh, the data set that, that I have to deal with, my computational data, my experimental data, is kind of a little bit like modern art. Can anyone tell me what this is? <laughs> nice try. I don't think so, though. <laughs> this is Mondria's work, but the title even doesn't tell us what it is. Now, this one, the title is unrelated to what this is, but you all know what this is. That's all. Uh, what is it? It's a tree, right? And how do we know it's tree? Well, we see this bark, we see the boundary, and this, this curve of the leaf, this boundary, the way this is a region that forms a leaf, the way this is a region that forms the bark, the local connectivity and clearly shaped boundaries of this kind of realistic images, making use of that was the key for the success of convolutional neural networks. Now, that same approach wouldn't work for this. However, if you dial back in time, same artist one year before, this is starting to look something more concrete, and the title is a little kinder, more informative. And now go back a few years earlier. This is obviously a tree, and the title is also a tree. Now that gives us some sense that, oh, maybe what's being depicted here is also a tree. And this was indeed a series of, result of a series of studies of trying to abstract a tree. So now in um, trying to study my quantum mechanical states that are ever so mysterious, always only telling us only a little bit about itself. Um, and the kind of things that we want to recognize is not cat or dog, but very sophisticated mathematical concept that took us tens of years to come up with. Um, it seems very reasonable to expect that the insight we have is going to be important in having synergy with um, machine learning tools. So um, we have made our first um, inroad into the subject with this paper, where we pointed out that by having a theoretically guided feature selection strategy, we can teach neural network um, topological states. Because there were a lot of you saying you're uh, physicists, I will boldly present the model. Uh, it's a simple model, it's just a hopping model, but if you don't know what a uh, type binding model is, that's okay, it's not relevant. But just for those of you who would be able to follow, I'm just giving you the information, uh, uh, data about the system we we're studying, that this is a model, it has topological quantum tra phase transition at this imaginary hopping strength of 0.5, uh, for kappa less than 0.5, it's trivial insulator. Kappa greater than 0.5, it's churn insulator. Now, uh, because when we started working on this at the time, uh, colleagues who, my, uh, my, uh, my colleagues who had entered the field earlier were all struggling trying to figure out how to teach neural network something other than uh, what looks like black and white image, that is the Ising model. Um, we entered this uh, field with an idea that perhaps we should make sure we give the right kind of information. We shouldn't do to our poor neural network what I did to you with that cat and dog. So um, we thought we should give the kind of input that has the relevant information in it. So what is the relevant information for churn insulator? There is this notion of a churn number, which is integrating over the momentum space of this uh, Berry flux. Even if you don't know what this is, it's, it's okay. Um, it has a physical response associated with it. That is, the Hall conductivity is going to be quantized with the integer determined by this topological invariant. Now, um, knowing that there is this invariant, we then thought about how to write it in a real space, local kind of measure, because we're trying to form something that looks like an image, but image with the right kind of information. Now, this was known that there is a real space 
local expression for the, uh, the uh, Hall conductivity or the churn number, where these PIJs are uh, two-point functions, and S is assigned area of the triangle. And this two-point function is, this is really an expectation value. If you're calculating it in a, a variational Monte Carlo sense, you have to converge your Monte Carlo instances um, average over a lot of them to um, average out the noise. Now, uh, what we came up with was the idea of um, forming an input we call quantum loop topography. And this is input uh, for each site. It consisted of different loops that we could make up. Um, and the, we organized the data, input data, based um, by the size of the loops. Smallest loop in the square lattice will be this triangle. And for associated with this site will be four triangles that are using this site as a, a vertex. And um, the triangles were uh, made up of uh, this evaluation of the hopping matrix element evaluated a single Monte Carlo instance. Now each entry at, uh, associated with a site is complex valued. And uh, my input vector, uh, like the input that was given to the, uh, the child who's dropped the food, now the input vector is only this long. And the result was uh, very exciting. If you give the wrong kind of input, like playing the cat and dog game the way I played with you, uh, the neural network could not learn the phase transition. But if you give the quantum loop topography as an input, it found, uh, well, what's happening here is that we are training at one um, deep end of the phase diagram, another deep end of the phase diagram, and the rest was obtained by the neural network, um, trained in uh, extreme ends, and it's finding the phase transition precisely. And we found that just the smallest triangle was efficient, um, and um, we were able to get the phase diagram in about a minute, 10 minutes or so on a laptop with a high degree of accuracy. Moreover, if we zoom in, we see sort of a singularity, which is um, telling us that there is something really qualitatively changing there. So we organize these loops. Uh, by the dimension and associated each site with all the triangles. And using that as an input, we were um, quite successful. And that was, the, uh, that was the end of this first paper. And then we started to wonder, but how did it work so well? Why did it work so well? What I didn't tell you was that what was the network architecture we used? We were new to this um, subject, and we were just learning from some open source books. And we tried with something that we could just write by our hands. So we used a very simple, just single hidden layer, feed forward, fully connected neural network, homemade neural network. And, um, and the results were uh, very compelling. And we wanted to figure out what's going on. Only after writing the paper, I learned that you know, we could call what we've uh, used as a shallow network as opposed to deep network. We had only a single hidden layer. But the advantage of working with such simple, really baby neural network is that we have an opportunity to do the interpretation. Um, I've seen from uh, Tim's uh, presentation that there is going to be a whole day devoted to interpretability. But those who are in machine learning community know very well interpretability is a, a challenging issue. So what, what we were able to do here is we took a trained neural network and we looked inside all the weights. And what we found was that um, there were a total 60 uh, weights. But all uh, looking at one of the weights, really most of the neurons were not doing anything in the trained neural network. That's not how it started, but that's where it ended up. It ended up with most of the weight concentrated on one um, neuron that allowed us to reverse engineer um, from the uh, weight of the trained neural network what was its decision being based on. So now this is a plot of, the, uh, of what are the, uh, all the uh, neurons that were being active. The, most of the inputs that were being taken seriously were uh, the smallest loops. And when we took 
the, we, we are using a rectified linear unit for the activation function, which means the activation is just a matter of criteria. There is, in, uh, there is greater than or less than um, criteria for the activation. So we were able to uh, figure out from the weight that this was the activation condition. Now, uh, massaging this expression just a little bit brings us to this expression. Now, this is starting to look like the uh, churn number, the topological invariant. So what the neural network had learned through our training was that what it's supposed to do with the input to make the decision that are approved by me um, or the, um, a postdoc, Frank, was to combine the input and form the topological invariant, the churn number. And that was very satisfying. Now, in remaining, uh, how many minutes? Seven minutes. Remaining seven minutes, I want to tell you about what we're doing, trying to gain uh, theoretical insight from um, experiment. So mysteries of high TC superconductivity. Uh, this is an uh, example of a data set. But um, what are the mysteries? Well, for a conventional superconductor, the phase diagram was very simple. There wasn't even a phrase phase diagram because all you did, there was a single parameter, that's the temperature. You cool down the temperature, you go from the Fermi liquid metal to superconductor. There was a single phase transition and that was it. When um, high TC cuprates were discovered, and again now um, iron-based superconductors as well, the phase diagram is very complex with there are many different phases. Some of them um, have well uh, recognizable orders, but some of them are unidentified. Uh, un unidentifiable regions, and this pseudo gap region has been like Sphinx guarding the entrance to Tebe, um, eating up people who cannot solve the riddle. Uh, to our community, it ate up com uh, careers of many young people. Now, uh, the riddle of Sphinx was solved by a single hero, but we, we are now increasingly feeling the riddle of pseudo gap is going to be solved by the effort of the community because now there is increasing evidence that there is a uh, specific ordering going on, broken symmetry states. And this is an uh, example imaging of the data set associated with that state that's supposedly mysterious. Now, this is the scanning tunneling microscopy that I showed you earlier. And these patterns that are seen here are not in lattice spacing that are at a larger spacing than lattice. It's kind of like a standing wave uh, looking. Uh, it's a collective phenomena, just like the wave in that stadium was a collective phenomena of people. This is a collective phenomena of electrons. Now, there are some regularity in the pattern which invites one to do the Fourier transform. But if you do the Fourier transform, what you see is these blobs. Now, the question that's been um, plaguing us is, what is the right way to think about this pattern? Because if you figure out how to think about this, that might help us solve um, the mysteries associated with, with pseudo gap and uh, gain better insight into high TC superconductivity. Should we think of it as really interference of waves? Or should we think of it as uh, interaction-driven uh, local phenomena? The questions are, uh, what is the right origin? Should we think about it in position space? Should we think about it in the momentum space? The uncertainty principle says you know, one or the other likely is a better starting point. Um, is it a checkerboard or is it a stripe? And um, in 2006, a group at Stanford and Subir's group also wrote papers trying to discern this and um, declare defeat within manual schemes. Now, Sabir, correct me if you wouldn't agree with me saying. <laughs> OK, so now both groups agree with my description of this being declaring of the defeat. So now we want to revisit this problem with um, neural networks. So what we did in uh, my group is we proposed a three-stage protocol, which is kind of similar to what uh, Michael was doing. Uh, we simulate, categorize uh, diverse training sets, and then uh, we train the neural network with the training set. And then we gave the um, experimental data to see what it says. Now, um, for our problem, our uh, training set generation was guided by theoretical understanding of charge density waves, what kind of disorder it can have, what kind of defect it can have. We have a lot of theoretical understanding and that guides our um, simulation of the training set, which has uh, phase disorder, amplitude disorder, as well as topological defects. 
And turned out the topological, topological defects make it very hard to train convolutional neural network, but it was much easier to train a uh, simple feed-forward neural network. And because our input size isn't so big, convolution was really not necessary. So these are different candidate wave vector descriptions for that system, the, the, the data set. And um, these different candidates are representing um, different wave vector that are sort of a leader, organizational leader wave vector. And one of them is commensurate, 0.25, category two is commensurate, rest is sort of incommensurate. So um, that's the scheme, and this is the result. How many minutes do I have? Four, Four. okay, plenty. All right, um, so on the leftmost column are raw data taken at different, for, from different samples at some high energy scale uh, called surugap. So this um, P is a carrier concentration. This is so-called underdoped, this is overdoped. These are different samples, but um, they are from the same family with increasing um, carrier concentration. You take the Fourier transform, and Fourier transform is kind of blurry. And what my goal is trying to figure out in this sort of a broad population of peaks, who is the leader? of that p the population. And um, the reason why Fourier transform is not sufficient is because Fourier transform is just a linear transformation. It's a change of basis. You change basis if you know what a good basis is. You would obviously change to that basis. Um, turned out momentum is not a good basis because uh, the these modulations are very short ranged. So neither real space nor momentum space is um, presenting to be an uh, ideal basis, and Fourier transform does not give us enough information. It's kind of hard to tell by just looking at these intensities, but this peak structure is very jagged. So it's not a smooth distribution where you will confidently place the center, but it's very jagged, which makes it hard to analyze this with the Fourier, uh, Fourier analysis. Now this is the outcome of my neural networks. We trained 80 different neural networks, and that's giving us this kind of distribution in their opinions. But it's very clear for these three sets, what is the category, what is the candidate that the neural network is voting overwhelmingly, giving a mandate? It's the second category, the, uh, the second candidate. Now there's red and yellow. What the red and yellow is for is uh, our simulated data set. If you had sharp eyes, you might have noticed. Our simulated data set was unidirectional. So we had um, here a modulation running along this direction. So what we did was we gave the uh, neural network the real data in one orientation and in 90 degree rotated orientation, trying to answer whether there is a pre preference towards one direction versus the other that would be breaking C4 symmetry, or it, it, it's um, equally likely. Now, when we looked at uh, the energy dependence, now that's what, why I have these um, layers. When we looked at the energy dependence of one of the samples, what we found was that as we go up in energy beyond certain energy scale, not only category two uh, became dominant, it became so with um, different degree of confidence in one orientation versus the other one orientation versus the other, one orientation versus the other. So just keeping track of one orientation where we are seeing large confidence, what we find is that um, as a function of energy, there is this one orientation that's really becoming um, established in the category two, which is a commensurate uh, modulation. Commensurate means that the period of this, uh, this modulation is locked with uh, the lattice um, precisely integer multiple by four. So through that exercise, we ruled out the sort of uh, interference wave-driven phenomena and um, concluded that the experiment, uh, according to the neural network, is better um, described by unidirectional lattice commensurate period four charge modulations. Um, I've told you a little bit about um, two directions that is trying to go from the, uh, the models and the, the uh, Schrodinger equation to the description of the real system, and uh, the other trying to go from experimental data to its interpretation. But the journey has just begun, and 
these are many different activities that we're engaged in. And let me end with uh, acknowledgement to my collaborators. Launching into this very new direction for me uh, was really uh, uh, made possible by uh, my uh, then Beta postdoctoral fellow, Frank Zhang. Uh, he was very receptive to this idea of doing this something very different and new and very quick in learning. And we've been having so much fun since then. He's now moved to Peking University as a faculty. Um, Andre Mezaros, my former uh, postdoc, has done a great deal of work simulating the training sets. Data was taken by uh, Kazu Fujita uh, staff in a group of Seamus Davis. I had a fun collaboration with Roger and Simon. Roger introduced me to the idea of machine learning two years ago. Um, and right now, I'm learning real time and having a great deal of fun working together with my computer science colleagues at Cornell who uh, my colleague Paul Ginsberg introduced me to. With that, uh, let me um, end the talk and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Maybe uh, we can take a question. Does anyone? Well, I, I have a question actually. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, this is a very high dimensional space. Uh, is that a uh, direction in which uh, machine learning can make a big impact? Yeah, I think so, yeah, yeah. Because the data volume is really big. And uh, trying to discover what's going on in the data, human inspection is very slow and inefficient. And they only look at very small part of the data and throw it out because you cannot invest a graduate student time more than a year to a single data set. Our intuition is limited to one or two dimensions. Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe yeah. three. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but 3D, even when it's like scattered like that, I, can't, I couldn't yeah. make sense okay. out of it. Let's take one more, yeah. Uh, so you, the first example you showed. Yes. Very, very good point. Um, we didn't know at the time, but the, at the end of the day, the answer, the fact that um, we essentially needed one neuron says we didn't really need nonlinearity. So we could have done with the linear approach, uh, but we didn't know what we were doing at the beginning. But what that allowed us to discover is now we're using the similar approach because the physics of capturing that feature is going to apply in very many different settings. In that particular problem, because it is a non-interacting fermion problem, there was an algebraic expression that we were supposed to get. And it was just, it was a matter of picking the right terms and summing up with the right phase. It was a li linear combination. But we've now applied this to uh, other settings where it works equally well. And now we opened up the neural network and look at it, and we discovered that it had to do a nonlinear thing multiplying a lot of inputs and going from very local information to very global information of Wilson loops and so on. So we're in the learning process, but that's absolutely right. Okay. Let's thank Professor Kim again.